Hi, uh, I'm Brendan Conaboy, not Jen Krieger. Jen couldn't be here, so I'll be presenting both parts of today's play. And what we're talking about today is basically the four-year journey that was required to produce RHEL 8. So how Red Hat modernized RHEL 8 design, process, and culture. And for our marketing folks, RHEL is short for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So what are we talking about? We're talking about this problem we had. There was this one technical objective separating the operating system from the applications. We inside RHEL had two process nightmares to kind of sort out, and it took four years of work to get to the point that we could actually launch a new RHEL release with those process nightmares in hand. And it involved about 1,200 people overall inside the uh, Red Hat organization, so a full 10% of the company. So let's, uh, let's go back in time, back to March of 2015. This is when RHEL 8 began, and it was, it was great. We had a schedule. Uh, 8 Alpha was going to be based on Fedora 24, due July of 2016. 8 Beta, based on Fedora 25, due in February. And GA, due in August of 2017. Uh, that did not happen. Uh, August 2017 was two years ago. RHEL was launched more recently. So this other thing happened. Uh, at the same time, we started the RHEL 8 project. We also started the RHEL.next project, which was inspired by Fedora.next, actually. And RHEL.next was inspired by just the notion that if we divided the operating system from the applications, we could do some things we wanted to do that would be good for the product, uh, good for the distribution, good for the business. And for us, we were trying to solve that too fast, too slow problem that Matthew talked about, where some things you want to deliver faster, some things you want to deliver slower. It didn't seem tractable to please everybody all of the time. But for our customers, what they wanted was a really stable operating system, but also really rapid moving applications. Like you want your OS, you don't boot your distribution just to boot. You like boot it because you're going to run something. And so whatever you're going to run, you want your operating system to be rock solid, but you also want your applications to have the features that you want. And generally, that means getting up upstream uh, into the distribution as rapidly as possible and as safely as possible. So basically, we make upstream safe for consumption. And on top of all that, we wanted to be able to add features without changing the user experience. So all the time, people were like, I want everything the way it is, only with this one thing. And when you put all of those one things together, you get into this problem where you've changed everything for everybody. So uh, we, we kind of had this contradiction of how do we serve everybody the thing that they want and yet not change anything for anybody that they don't want it. So with this problem in mind, we actually stopped the Rel 8 project. We just put it dead in its tracks. It was such a hard stop that there was a swear jar. Like we were meeting at, at a conference ahead, or ahead of DevConf in Czech Republic in 2016, and we actually had a swear jar. If you said Rel 8, you had to pay basically uh, a crown. So anyway, it was, it was significant. We decided, let's really solve this problem. Let's really put our energy into it. And what we, what we found was that we didn't actually know how to proceed. We didn't have the skills. We didn't have the tools. We didn't have the mindset. So what did we have? Well. We had Linux distributions, and they're over a quarter of a century old now, right? Like, like even Red Hat Enterprise Linux is, is pretty new in the grand scheme of things. Red Hat Linux came before that. Uh, Slackware came before that. SLS came before that. They're old, and, and they're kind of set in their ways. And then a distribution is just a, a composition of different components. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 is, is about 3,000 components overall, and each one of them has their, their own like every community has its own norms for development. And, and of course, because we're not the owner of those 3,000 communities, we're just participants. We, we are at best stewards of those communities. And so we can't just go in and make radical change. We actually have to go and work with all 3,000 different points of interest and do something that's compatible with all those communities. So RHEL, of course, is pretty successful. And we have we had most of the stewards of that success, but what we needed were actually new development teams. When we looked at the, the problems that we wanted to solve in the enterprise Linux business, it was we needed to make new code. 
whereas all these communities have existing code, existing, somebody created this thing and, and it's great and we're, we're using it and we're, we're working with them with it. We actually needed to make some net new things and that was not actually a skill that we were staffed for. And what we had were mature Linux distributions. Fedora is great and, and RHEL is great. And even CentOS has, has a, a great place for us. But what we needed was to actually change the fundamentals of all three of them. Like splitting the OS from the applications is, what does that even mean, right? Like one of the foundations of how things work right now is that anything can depend on anything. And this, this is pretty fundamental. And, and of course, we just have a legacy. We have people are used to using this. They're used to the way things are. But we actually need to, to change the way things are and not interfere. So what do you do when, you, when all of these come together? Well, you know, we said, this calls for Agile. Uh, and yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but it's also a little messy. So we did the usual thing that most companies do when they think, let's, let's do Agile. Uh, we tried out Scrum. Like, that is, that is the thing that makes sense to the most people because they're like, oh, there's, there's a schedule and there's feedback. And yeah, it's good. And that actually worked really well. We, we created some great scrum teams. We had some great projects. And we had great success. And we also made the typical blunders. Like, we just did textbook stuff. We had experts in, we had like highly proficient agile coaches and whatnot. We still made all the same mistakes. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those were. So first, what were the good things? <laughs> so we had scrum teams. And those teams actually did produce good work. They, they made new stuff. The, the, um, the foundation of modularity came from that. Our in-place upgrade infrastructure, a uh, uh, product called, I think it's, well, project-wise in Fedora, it's called Composer. It's like Red Hat Image Tool as a product. So w those came out of the Scrum teams we created, and they made net new stuff directed by product management. And that was a thing we hadn't done before. We, we built a muscle that, was, that we didn't have, or it was atrophied. And we did that with cross-functional teamwork. This was, this was also kind of a novel thing for us because we have a lot of developers. We, we staff extensively for engineering and less so for most other roles. And so that, that imbalance means that we end up with a lot of, uh, of self-directed engineers making choices without product managers or customer support or anything else kind of tempering design decisions. And, and we did some distribution experimentation just along the way of making RHEL 8, we, we wondered, okay, well, what is it that, that we want to have be the operating system and what is it that is the, the applications? Is it just the kernel versus user space? Is it like systemd? Is it what goes into a base container image? And we, we did a lot of different things. The fastest supercomputers in the world right now are running a variation of RHEL 7. Uh, this was internally codenamed Pegasus that has a more modern kernel and that, that worked very well for that use case, but it turned out it wasn't a really good general solution. So, so even though we got a lot of great success, not everything went well. And <laughs> I just want to cover two things that didn't work well. The first was that we didn't accept failure fast enough. And this is one of those things where if you're, if you're on the team, you see failure and you're like, I don't want to accept failure. I want to, like, I want to push through and make it work. And all failure, accepting failure means is observing that something isn't working and then making a change. And in those cases where we looked at what are the problems that we have, what are we going to do about it, and we, we really dug into it, we made significant change. And because of that significant change, those, those things rapidly got much better. And when we took a long time to actually have that, that honest introspection, uh, things dragged on and it was, it was very painful for many members of the team. So that was one thing. But there's this other thing. I mentioned earlier that we generally staff for uh, development over other roles. So in most, in most development houses in the industry, you have a pretty standard set of developers to quality engineers to product managers and whatnot. And it looks something like this. Like you usually have five to eight developers for every one product manager. And in, in our case, because of our long history, we actually have I think we started out with 130 to one product managers, and now it's down to like 75 or something. It it was it was really out of balance, and that meant that doing things like Scrum actually didn't work, or they didn't scale very well. So, what we learned 
was that you can't just take Scrum and, and apply it and have everything work great. Because when we did that, we topped out at about 50 people. We actually ran out of Scrum masters, we ran out of product managers, and we ran out of QEs. Like we just, we ran out of everybody but engineers. Of course, we wanted to create more teams, but we couldn't because we didn't have the people to do that with. And further, we needed to go from not, we didn't need 50 people, we needed to get 1,200 people to be adopting these process changes, to have these capabilities that they didn't have before, including remote staff. So a lot of best practices actually are designed for everybody's in the same building, in the same room, at very least in the same time zone. Uh, here we are, we uh, inside Red Hat have staff in basically every time zone on earth, literally, and the practices that are necessary to make that work are very different than what you would do if you had everybody in the same room. So we did manage to scale this though, and the way we did that was by formalizing a thing called autonomous subsystem teams, which is something that we didn't invent. It's actually something that the RHEL 7 team invented while we were doing our, our Scrum work because everybody faces the same problems. If one of the cool things about Agile is like science, you kind of rediscover the principles as you go along, and so the teams that were de delivering productized RHEL at that point in time were having the same scaling issues. And basically all they did was they took all of the roles that are necessary to, to move technology from like an idea to delivering it to a customer into one group. So product management, engineering, quality engineering, documentation support, like that end-to-end -end team, we just set one up for every single one of the technology areas where RHEL is, and they came together for L7 when they were gonna plan the next minor release update. Like 7.7 came out last week, and if there was a change in the networking stack, the networking subsystem team decided to do that, and they decided it on their own. So all we did was take that concept and apply some of the Agile principles to it, so no change on who was in a subsystem team, but we kind of scaled out what they were supposed to do. So they went from just planning to actually executing together. And that is, that is really fundamental. You can't just show up some of the time. You have to be there all of the time, or at least at the right times, in order to deliver uh, understanding to one another. Because basically, uh, it, you need to be a team, not just a group of people that, that do things sometimes related to one another. So we created all of these subsystem teams, uh, we made them in charge of themselves, and then we added optional agile facilitators for when they needed it. And by doing this, we were able to scale up a little bit. So that was the first two years of this four year journey. So where were we? It's March of 2017, let's do a checkpoint. So. Technology goals were instantiated upstream. We had modularity. We had other projects that were uh, well in hand. We were exploring uh, multiple cadence and, and other aspects of splitting the operating system from the applications. And we had roughly managed staffing ratios. It's still not great. It's better to just go with industry norms, but it was working out okay. And so we decided to restart RHEL 8 in March of 2017. And what, what actually happened? So, 8 Alpha was delivered on July of 2018. That was based on Fedora 27. 8 Beta was delivered in November. That was based on Fedora 28. And GA uh, in May, about two months ago, actually. And that was actually based on 8 Beta. So, once we get to Beta, we stop inheriting from Fedora, which is the topic of, of a, a talk next, or tomorrow, actually. So, we did that, but how did we do that? Like, what were the actual steps? Like, what were the things that we did? Because, like, just creating subsystem teams is not the end result. It's like, what did we learn and how did we apply it to all 1,200 people? So the first thing was creating empathy between roles. So, as I mentioned, we mostly are engineers inside the RHEL division. Like, eight times out of 10, you're an engineer if you work on RHEL. And that often means that you don't know what somebody else does. You don't understand their role. And you don't know how what you do affects them or how what they're doing is supposed to affect you. And so this was a pretty deep change for us. Uh, likewise, RHEL uses a waterfall schedule. This is, we, we didn't do Scrum. And in fact, if you try doing Scrum across 1,200 people, uh, all in the same sprint cycle, there are definite scaling issues. And so we had a waterfall versus agile problem to tackle. And then we also just had these outdated tools. So 
our two process problems were basically waterfall and planning because the ability to plan fundamentally is about being able to see what the big picture is and break it down into actionable pieces and then take action and we didn't really have good tooling for that so what was the foundation for our change like how did we how did we kind of apply some of these insights that we gained and this is this is the hardest thing of anything and it's just it's just getting started because it is so easy to do what you have done that just starting is the hardest part sometimes. So let's, let's think about this. When you need to change the process for 1,200 people, what do you do? What do you choose? What is, what is the way to start? And further, what if they've been doing it for 20 years? What if they, like their entire lifetime, their entire career, they've done things one way and you you want them to do it another way. Well, oh, and just side note, the, the RHEL development process is based on the Red Hat Linux development process, which was created in 1998. That's when the first Bugzilla was filed. The Agile Manifesto wasn't even a gleam in somebody's eyes until three years after that. So it's a really deeply entrenched production process, kind of based more in, in like physical manufacture of goods than, than rapid software development practices. So where did we start? We started with a tool, which is the exact opposite of anything you're ever supposed to do. Like tooling is not the right thing. Like a tool is a means to an end. And th there's only one reason why we started with a tool. And that's because we didn't have a tool to do the thing that we needed to do in order to create empathy, to plan together, to do any sort of, of capacity work. And that tool was JIRA, actually. So that's how we started. We started with a tool. But just having a tool doesn't mean you know how to use it. So we invested in organizational abilities. And, and what does that mean? Uh, first thing is how versus what. So a lot of the time when you see a problem, if you're an engineer, the first thing you think is, oh, I know how to solve that. Let's do this. Let's do that. And when you're trying to execute at scale, what you actually need are some people to be in charge of the what needs to be done and some people in charge of the how you do that. And the way it normally breaks down is that the product management, your support organization, uh, people that are deeply aligned up tune or upstream or tuned into where things are going really need to focus on the what. And then the people that are, are really fantastic at, at handling code and and implementing things and whatnot are, are really good at the how. So how versus what? And the other piece is just ownership versus leadership. There are so many, so many people that want to be owners, but in open source, most people don't own anything. We are, we are working together. We are just trying to get things done. And there are things that we want to do. And leadership, you can sometimes get people to do the same things you want to do. Ownership is kind of like a proprietary notion, right? And, and that kind of leads to the last thing, which is the difference between consensus and consent. When you have 1,200 people, how do you get everybody to agree on it? You generally don't. What you do is you find the things that everybody can live with. And if you get there, you have gone far because 1,200 people are definitely going to give you their opinions. That is, that is, that is Fedora. That is, that is how we develop. We have opinions. But if some of them are just because we came up with one and some of them are because we are the, the expert and it deeply affects us and we, we are informed, those are the ones that we want to have consensus from and consent from, from those that can live with choices. So those were the organizational abilities. And then when we actually put it into practice, we, were, we kind of started out with, with, have you all used Bugzilla? <laughs> If you look at Bugzilla under the hood, it's just a, it's a database with, with a little web interface on top. It is, it's pretty primitive as far as tools go, but it is like grains of sand. And, and the metaphor here is that it's like playing checkers. Playing with Bugzilla is like playing ch with checkers. And when you actually want to plan, when you want to actually talk about and design the, the beach resort, you need something more sophisticated. It's more like playing uh, a game of chess. And so, starting with a tool, developing the abilities to, to actually listen to the right people or be the right person to be listened to, and then the tool to actually have the conversation in 
That's how we got started. So when we did that, when we had those things in place, then we could actually realistically talk about the things that we could do inside of RHEL. And this is where, this is where things got kind of interesting and, and more into how does Fedora and RHEL relate to one another because one of the things that we figured out was that if you want to give customers the feature that they want without forcing everybody to adopt that feature themselves, you actually have to make it opt-in. Like, we all have a preference of opt-in versus opt-out spam, right? Well, we all, it turns out that everybody actually wants opt-in versus opt-out features. So if you can do that, and we did it a lot, uh, in part due to the uh, Fedora changelog process, we scanned hundreds of those and read them and made uh, decisions about whether we were going to keep them, revert them, document them, do training for them. It was really helpful. And in many cases, we just documented it. In a few cases, we changed things to be opt-in. And in other cases, we just did whole hog uh, reversion. So probably the biggest example I can think of is DNF. When we looked at how wildly different the DNF experience was between uh, Yum and, and DNF, we started a two and a half year project just to get DNF behavior to look more like Yum behavior because that would have been you know, kind of like the system D of RHEL 8. We didn't want to have another one of those cases where we did great technology but also got negative publicity for that great technology just because it was incompatible. Uh, the other piece was that when the teams were actually doing their work, they got to own their process. So inside the traditional RHEL waterfall <laughs> schedule, there, there's basically this, this huge waterfall like Niagara Falls kind of set of milestones. And what we did was say, okay, within these windows, you can do whatever you want as long as your output is the, the thing that is needed. So however you want to develop, if you want to do Scrum, if you want to do Kanban, you want to do just like your own process, you can do whatever you like as long as it happens between these boundaries. And that's, even though that doesn't mean we got rid of a waterfall schedule, it meant that we changed the relationship between what the teams were doing and how we talked about the schedule. And then finally, because we were adopting new tools, uh, a lot of the time, our tools shape our thinking. So our tools shape our processes, our processes tie to our tools. When we introduced a new tool, there was a natural inclination to say, okay, let's just copy everything over. And it was really important to create space between the old and the new. So while we have some bridges between the old and new tools, we're trying to actually create a better way of working in new tools so that teams can, can like more readily adopt modern software development methods. They don't have to, but they can. So how are we doing? Like we, we made all these changes. We you know, seems kind of fluffy, but uh, just as a reminder, these were the focuses for change. Empathy, waterfall versus agile rolling out the tools. So how do we do an empathy between roles? We, we got some things done and some things we're still working on. So now all roles are represented on subsystem teams and for the first time in RHEL's 15 year life, the team is not who your manager is, the team is what your technology area is and whether you're an engineer or a quality engineer or you know, any other kind of technology specific role, that is your team. Your manager is kind of irrelevant to the matter. And we made them a little more real with quarterly planning. So one of the things I didn't mention, I probably should have, is that within old RHEL schedules, we would talk about RHEL 7 as its own program, and 6 as its own program, and 8 as its own program. And all of the schedules are separate, and it's really structured as though the people are different in every one of them, and the technology is different in every one of them. The truth is, it's all the same people. With, almost without exception. It's almost all the same technology. The difference between the bash in RHEL 7 and the bash in RHEL 8 is not a lot. Like, it's, it's just a few patches, and they're great patches. But uh, when, when you treat multiple releases as though it were a separate set of individuals, you actually create a situation where people are very likely to overcommit, and overcommitting is, is the the path to burnout, it's the path to frustration, it's the path to bad work really. So uh, quarterly planning is a thing that we've implemented or are kind of in the process of implementing where we review all of our releases, like all of our work at one time and decide just what we're gonna do over a short period of time. And that is the thing that most teams are doing now 
And we also implemented facilitation norms for those teams that did need to have an Agile practitioner. We standardize on Agile practices that are based on best practices. So they don't have to use them, but if they want, uh, if they want to go Agile, they have ways to do it. But there are still some things that we're working on. So the, the ratio of product managers to developers is still too high. The, the number of people writing documentation is not enough, things like that. It's something that we're still working on. But we have like the path, we have, a, we have quantified what the problem is. And if you can see what is needed, see where you are, then it's very easy to chart a course to getting there, much more so than just like this nebulous feeling of something's wrong. And uh, also we're just working on getting better reports out of the tools that we've adopted because we have like these high level planning tools and we, we are executing on the low levels and we're tying them together and actually getting a good visualization for how am I doing on creating that, that resort at the beach is, it's tricky it turns out. It's more tricky than just talking about the state of every grain of sand. So the second part, waterfall versus agile. How are we doing? So we updated the program cycle considerably. One of the things that was announced when RHEL came out was that instead of this thing where we're reluctant to talk about when will the next RHEL release be, has anybody ever wondered when the next RHEL release is going to be? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been shrouded in mystery. Uh, I guess because you don't know either. <laughs> Honestly, that is, that is true. Because what we, what we did early on was we would set the schedule based on what the needs were. And those needs came from our customers, from our hardware partners, and we would mix all of those things down and we'd come up with the exact optimal schedule if everything went right. Nothing ever went right, it ended in crisis. Uh, and as the number of customers has increased, it's a good problem to have. As the number of partners have increased, it's a good problem to have. It's gotten harder and harder to do that. When RHEL 8 was launched, we also announced that we would just be making a release every six months. So. Uh, approximately six months, you know. It's, it's notional. Uh, 8.1 beta is already out, so we're on track for that. But that is, that was kind of like groundbreaking. So for, for us, we can actually say we know when rel 8.6 will be out or 8.10 will be out, and, and anybody can line up on that. And then we just reimagine Waterfall <laughs> by, by the role people are fulfilling, not by the outcome. So within any boundary we provide, the, the thing that needs to be done should happen, but it doesn't have to happen on this date or that date. It's just, you know, you have this spectrum that you can work in. And we're still working on that schedule. Like getting to a six month schedule has, has come at a cost of cutting some things down and leaving some things large. And actually, when you go from a nine to 12 month schedule to a six month schedule, it's still really easy to overcommit. So we're still working on, you know, what does it look like? What does it optimally look like to to plan, build, test, and deliver a release every six months. Uh, right now we're erring on the side of stability because that's what customers primarily are looking for. And we're still rolling out quarterly planning and uh, we're still working on consistently meeting deadlines. Like we're, we're doing pretty good on this. Like things are coming out on time or within one day, but that's because of a lot of high contact management, not because everybody's used to it yet. So we're making progress. And then updating outmoded tools, what does that actually mean? So for us, it means that we're using a combination of Bugzilla and Jira. So Bugzilla is like a big community interface. It is, it is where developers do their work. It is, it is fundamental, it's foundational. And the way that we've adopted Jira is that there are just some BZs that are in Bugzilla where we set a little flag in the BZ and it gets mirrored to Jira. In Jira, we have like our high level plans and we can drop those BZs into epics. And so we have this wider data container to hold work in. So if there's like 20 different development items across like three subsystem teams, we can have three epics that go into one feature that, that uh, are all in Bugzilla. So if you're an engineer, you work in Bugzilla, you don't have to do anything because your workflow didn't change at all. Because changing people's workflows is unpopular. But uh, if you are one of the, the team leads, you did planning, you connected everything up, and you can then see the, the high level effect. One thing that we, we knew was really important was to not have to replicate data. Like if there are two sources of truth, one of them is always going to be wrong and that's the one somebody's gonna rely on. So yep. <laughs> it's, it's so important to, to have there only be one source of data and have that source of data be something that people actually want to update. So that, 
that they're, it's not like a burden to go in and get things be current. It actually has to be part of their workflow for them to be happy. And so changing Bugzilla was, was a non-starter. And of course, also, when we went with JIRA, what we discovered was some organizational issues that we were completely unaware of. So I mentioned that, that balance between development and, and other roles being out of whack, but what actually happens is that the way Bugzilla is set up is also developer-centric. Like the, the most people that do work have a workflow that works really well for them. So everybody that isn't that, their workflow, their work, their output is kind of hidden somewhere else. Like you will never see in a BZ the, the documentation that's going to be updated. You won't see the test plan. You won't see any of this stuff. It doesn't even have a place for that to go. So how do you know that documentation is important? How do you know that there's a plan for testing? Uh, how do you know that you need to hire more people because that thing doesn't exist actually? Uh, in JIRA, we actually treat all of those different things as, as on parity. Within the same epic, we have bugzillas for engineering activities. We have test plan, test case development, verification, documentation, doing demos. They, they're all there side by side. And by raising the profile of non-development work, we're actually creating visibility so that development knows, oh, I, I need to actually be done on time because all these other people ha can't even start until I'm done. So we've gotten that far, but we're still making use of this. We're still kind of feeling out what is the best way to use epics. Should we use subtasks? Like, you get all these features and you kind of go crazy with like, oh, let's do all the things. And uh, making good use of tools means kind of standardizing on practices that actually work well for people. And you only learn that through iteration. So we're iterating. And of course, uh, process automation, like actually having to update things in, in JIRA isn't a great experience. If, if it could just automatically update when BZs update, like your epic status, that would be super. Because right now, uh, we have two, two sources of truth. If all of, the, all of the bugzillas are being updated regularly, but there's some data type above it, like an epic that says, I'm just waiting to be done, and, and all the BZs under it are done, that epic should say, I'm also done. And without automation, that only happens by human updating it, which means it's no longer accurate, which means we've kind of missed the, that whole point of, of a single source of truth. So we're working on that automation. So with all of that in mind, where did, where did we end up with it? So I would say right now the, the REL organization has reluctantly gotten into a mindset of continuous improvement. It is no longer the case that teams are like, ah, oh, we've launched REL, it's back to normal, no change, we will just be our, our stodgy cantankerous selves, dissatisfied with the way things are, but living with it. It's, it's actually the case that there are changes that are going to be happening every single release, and we're trying to roll them out responsibly and respectfully, but there's an expectation now that there didn't used to be. There's, an, there's this notion that you can actually introduce change for the better instead of just complaining about it, which was the, the state for quite some time. Uh, we also have a much, much greater state of empathy between roles, especially between development and QE. Like, like it is, they are, they are our brothers and sisters in engineering now. The, the fact that there's engineer in, in both of us, both of our job titles is, is no longer lost on us. And in those two things, we are, when we're working in Fedora, when we're working upstream, we are really heavily focused it's not perfect yet, but we are heavily focused on delivering changes that are opt-in, that, that let people use them, but not have to use them, that let customers or end users all choose the things that they turn on and continue to get the value out of uh, Fedora, out of Rail, out of CentOS that is right for them so they don't have to kind of take a long time to adopt new releases, which is really where this all came from, was you know, changing versions is hard. Uh, RHEL 7 was based on Fedora 19, and RHEL 8 was based on Fedora 28. Can you imagine just like doing a yum update from Fedora 19 to 28? Like that would, it would fail, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> and your system wouldn't boot. If and you yeah, if you got that far. <laughs> and, and even then, just there's there's so much so much change and so much of it wasn't optional, like building those options in were was a fundamental. And so 
between continuous improvement and, and like respecting roles and, and like developing technology for, for people to actually use, we're in a state where we don't have to plan uh, a 24 month schedule out and, and like design technology for yesterday's problems that, that no longer are relevant for today's solutions. And you put all this all together and you can actually make your changes just in time. You can, you can iterate, you can build for the current moment. And that's really the biggest change for eight was that shortened schedule, paying attention to customers, designing for opt-in means that you deliver the right things at the right time. Whew. Any questions? Neil. So uh, one of the things you mentioned that is you were trying to figure out how to align um, your development cycles and planning cycles with it, uh, with the cadences that you want to release, uh, rel 8 point releases, mm -hmm. probably future rel releases and stuff like that. Um, one of the things that I found like when I was working with a, in this kind of agile world was that it's hard to make expectations about engineering effort going in beyond like a month. Have you looked at like partitioning how the, the engineering effort and planning stuff goes into like, instead of doing it at six month intervals, partitioning it like into one or two month intervals and seeing how that, if that snaps better for, for that kind of thing. Oh yeah, we are, we are working on micromanaging that schedule. So uh, we launch a new release every six months, but the total cycle time, like the from start to finish is like nine and a half months right now, which is way too long, and we're trying to shorten that. But there, there is a period of planning, which is principally why it's longer than six months. And then there's a development window, a testing window, and then a final testing window. So within that development window, apart from just shortening it, we've actually uh, set it up so that you have to do your features first, and then your bugs. I mean, you can do bugs, but you're incentivized to get your features done early. And the reason we do that is that features are generally more invasive, uh, but they also require new novel tests to be created. They require new documentation to be written. So if we get the things that require more people done early, we can parallelize. Like all of this, like my summary for this is we just did like make minus J on RHEL. Like just <laughs> setting, up the, setting up the make files to run in parallel is kind of the foundation of it. And, and absolutely part of that is by shortening windows and by making the things happen early that are better to happen early. Right. And so the other, another part of this is that um, you mentioned using the Jira planning stuff and things like that. Um, and I've seen in the release notes mentions of those as references. Mm -hmm. um, is there any chance in the future that we will maybe start seeing some of those like in a form where we, people can read those and justifications and things like that in the same way that we can read VZs? Yes. Not there yet. Uh, right now, the Jira server is behind a firewall. Um, work is being done to make that not true. I mean, I don't say you have to expose Jira, but like the stuff that's in the yeah, Jira. yeah. I want to. I want to expose Jira. I want. I want community to be able to engage with us where we are. Oh, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Because one of the things we can do on that portfolio <coughs> is guess what the future is and go, hey, if I move this bulk to this part, what's the implication and recalculate it? So, I mean, having the community do that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm familiar with some of Jira's more interesting features because at my workplace we use it. And it's just the same reason why I'm really glad you didn't just say, well, we're going to burn Bugzilla to the ground. Because as it turns out, it's not that good at being Bugzilla anymore. Yeah, the, every tool has a place. Yeah. Laura. I would say the fundamental reason why all this change is necessary is that nobody knows why all this change is necessary. Like literally, everybody is complaining about everything all of the time and change, if you're not paying attention, you don't know why things are happening, but fundamentally everything that is happening is to address some problem that's like a legit problem. So uh, like if, if 
developers are unhappy about something and we take some action to fix it, will they be happy that we fixed the something or will they be unhappy that there is a change? The answer is yes. <laughs> so what we generally try to do is talk about the why extensively, but the fact is a lot of people don't notice the why. Everyone's overwhelmed by like sheer volume and so people don't notice the why until they've actually run into the what and then there's like a retroactive, why is this happening to me? And then you explain it and they're like, oh, that makes sense. Why didn't I know that? Because like, you didn't go to this thing or read that thing or hear this thing. Like over communication in, with 1200 people is actually not possible. You cannot say something enough times in enough forums to actually get more than like a 50% hit rate. Did that answer your question or did I just like filibuster? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take it. Oh yeah, actually that's a great question. Yeah, so I'm gonna repeat that. So the, the question is, is is the result of all this that developers can see more of, of the result of their work and the why? And the answer is absolutely. So here's the thing. When you're just working on BZs, if you're just working on a task, you don't really know where it came from. You just know that it showed up and, and for some reason you're working on it. And you might wanna know, why am I working on this thing? What, what does this connect to? And the whole point of having planning tools is that you can connect your work to like a broader objective, to a, a greater goal. And our theory is that if you have like transparency in the reason why you're doing something, you can make better decisions, possibly without even asking somebody. So if if you take the trouble to to like look at the work and go, hey, what does this connect to? And then read the thing it connects to, you can go all the way back to a market problem. You can see what other things are being worked on and how they're supposed to work together. Like these things are, are meant to allow greater transparency, to increase understanding, to actually give people like the, the holistic view, not just this little micro uh, bit of implementation. Question on your tree mod plan. Uh -huh. What percentage are you roughly hitting? No, that's across now so I would totally defer that question to Jen but I think she'd say about two-thirds okay. when we get to 100% all sorts of things happen it's, it's gonna be great all right other questions all right cool thank you for coming <laughs>